Thanks so much for that. That was a, a great introduction to uh, to, to Lean FT. Um, and, you know, bringing back the story of, of when, you know, Lean FT was born originally when the R&D guys uh, were working on it in Israel, it was, they called it Coded FT and it was a bit too close to Coded UI at the time, uh, which is why they changed the name. But, um, you know, partly why, why they were de developing that was really for this new challenge around continuous integration, continuous delivery and deployment. And really, how quickly can you get value down the pipeline? Um, and I think this is a really interesting challenge um, in the sense of the mind shift that's I, I'm going to try and explore today um, and just kind of give you an idea of maybe some of the gaps that we still need to see and you know where potentially the product's going to be going so let me just kind of give a bit of background about myself um i've been a vivid board member now for uh, as on the uh, as a, the director of advocacy uh for the last six to eight months um and i've been working with the team uh, around really helping bring this kind of partner ecosystem and and some of the challenges that you're seeing uh, in the industry with with all these different new stacks from things like the analytics and big data to kind of the ADM space, which we're here today to talk about. Uh, and, you know, I spend a lot of time talking um, uh, about this subject and also kind of blogging on on on, on it as well, uh, which was my entire weekend was talking uh, a blog, which hopefully will be out on the 20th around uh, how you use automation to test uh, machine learning and AI platforms, um, which you, as you could probably expect, you know, using things like exertions uh, is, is a lot more difficult when you're dealing with machine learning where the data changes consistently. So, you, you know, test data generation and uh, modeling suddenly become, you know, extremely important when you're talking about graph machine learning and, uh, and yeah, you have to change the mentality, which is kind of where I'm kind of going to talk about and kind of introduce a very high level today. Uh, and then really kind of go into, um, you know, maybe some more practical things of what you can do from a behavioral change perspective uh, within your organization. And I think, as you know, we kind of covered slightly earlier on in this session, this whole kind of concept around shift left has been uh, a big focus. And it's been this focus of, uh, you know, bringing it earlier into the life cycle, you know, really looking at, you know, bringing in software developers and tests. So people who can write code and, you know, fit nicely into that development life cycle. Uh, and my kind of question or kind of uh, concern is maybe we've, we've slightly missed the point there in the sense of it actually should be a lot earlier in the life cycle all the way back to the design. So the thinking aspect. And when we start looking at using things like lean uh, UX or, you know, lean startup methodologies, you know, we're trying to prove a hypothesis very quickly. So being able to understand the requirements or at least understand, you know, those approve a hypothesis to a uh, an experiment very quickly. You know, partly what we need to do is we need to prove these systems and those systems can be conceptual. Those they may not exist. They may have never even seen an agile um, sprint. You know, part of the the idea with innovation labs and this failing fast and failing rapidly is you should be able to build something incredibly quickly to prove out uh, a concept. And then on the other side of it, which I think is equally important, if not more important, is the, the shift right. And I kind of agree that potentially what we're looking at is, you know, this business process kind of uh, BPT kind of view of the world, which kind of was inherited from the Mercury days and test director and quality center bringing in kind of these jigsaw pieces of business processes, which is incredibly true in, if we look at how the industry is uh, moving towards business process automation, is that yes, it's important for businesses to be able to chain together their processes and what they're doing. So I know that's a lot of information to start and I, I'm kind of just wanting to kind of tease you in the kind of the idea of what are these kind of challenges that we're gonna potentially be looking at and how does that make things different? You know, a lot of the stuff that I've been testing and some of the stuff that I've been doing today, actually, you know, ranging from complex event processing on the left hand side, you know, you've got autonomous vehicles, car to X, vehicle to X, infrastructure to X, you know, dealing with smart city projects, you know, these things 
take a new way of being able to test things. And, you know, I, I give an example around smart cities and IoT. You know, this is where suddenly Lean FT becomes incredibly important. You know, Selenium is great when you're talking about testing web-based browser proxy kind of headless mode. That's absolutely fine. If it runs through a browser or, you know, it's an API, it's a different thing. You know, part of it is you need to be able to understand how you deal with applications that are don't have front ends anymore. And that's, you know, the IoT landscape where you've got to be able to interact with hugely complex ecosystems of ecosystems with a whole stack of data and data lakes and machine learning and information coming out from neural nets. Now, this is a very different view of the world than what potentially we're all very comfortable with in, in the UI space. <clears throat> so the question really comes back to, you know, it's, is it just shifting left? Is it getting earlier into the design phase or is actually, is it more about after the deliver phase? And, and you know, this is again, something that uh, Microfocus has been phenomenal at for, for many years. You know, the APM space or the application performance management area was really around how do we learn what actions are actually happening with our users? <clears throat> and once we know what actions are happening with our users, we can kind of predict their users and the behaviors of those users and adapt our systems to be able to respond to that, whether that's creating new features or functionality. But what that is, is feeding back into the life cycle as a continuous uh, learning process, not a end-to-end -end process, which we used to see from your V model traditional waterfall. But even now with this DevOps, it has an end and the end is the ops side of things. My question is, you know, where's the learning coming out of operations and coming back into that design aspect? And that really changes the way that we develop software and also how we leverage these tools, which is why I'm going <clears> to <throat> be talking a little bit about how you can use things like Lean FT within this, this life cycle, even though, you know, traditionally you wouldn't think it would be able to. So, um, you know, I've just seen Joe of Test Talks just interview uh, Iran, who was a co-writer at the, the Digital Quality Handbook. And for those guys who are, you know, trying to pick your favorite harness, whether that be the quantum framework, whether that be Serenity, you know, maybe you've started using Puppeteer to do headless, uh, you know, starting with Docker, whatever your approach is to continuous adaptive te testing, I definitely recommend checking out that book, the Digital Quality Handbook. There's a whole stack of people from Microsoft, Google, all talking about how they approach continuous quality or continuous testing. So if you're trying to get to that, how do, do you actually implement DevOps? I highly recommend that. And, you know, I do cover in the, one of the chapters around how you potentially deal with testing complex systems uh, and, you know, this new landscape of machine learning and AI. <clears throat> so, I'm going to kind of throw out some some kind of interesting kind of concepts here, which I like I said, there's a blog coming out on the 20th, which will hopefully support that. You know, we've seen a whole stack of variations around DevOps and test ops. And, you know, I think we've, we've kind of done that if to anything to death. You know, I've seen a push from the other side, which was this kind of ops dev kind of approach where people were looking at bringing in RPA tools, intelligent process automation to really think about how operations has been dealing with these kind of similar automation tasks with other tools like UiPath, Jadoka, or something like VIP, Visual Integration Processor. You know, part of it is those tools that have been there to actually chain together operational technology have been built in a very different way to the tools that we're, we're talking about today, like Lean FT, which came from a whole heritage of UI tools, starting off with things like XRunner, and then Windrunner, moving to QTP or Astra Quick Test, and then literally on to what we see in today with the QTP and UFT and now Lean FT. And you know, hopefully we'll get into you know why those tools are still incredibly important, but also how this shift towards RPA, the robotic process automation, also joins in the middle. So what I'm going to kind of throw out there, which I know a few of the um, micro focus have talked about with the big data analytics pillar, which they've got, is this kind of AI operations. So, you know, if they're looking, if organizations now have a 2020 strategy, you know, DevOps might have been in their 2018 strategy, but definitely AI is in their uh, 2020 strategy. They're going to be starting to build products with AI on them 
and also systems are going to be powered by AI. And this is an interesting one because there is already tools out in the market in the APM space that use machine learning and AI, whether that to be uh, looking at security and uh, uh, being able to you know, do predictive and detect before they happen incidents. You know, this is an understanding and obviously a, a, a good use case for AI in this space, but also it's around how you get AI solutions <clears throat> into operations. And actually today I've been with a client who's trying to do just that. And it's incredibly difficult because it, whether or not you're delivering to AWS and or Mechanical Turk, or you're going to try to using Spark ML, or you're using Neo4j, or you're doing whatever stack you're trying to deploy into a AWS or into Azure using the cognitive services that Microsoft have, it's still a way, a completely different way of delivering software in the same way that DevOps was a massive cultural shift previously. And I think this is why it's important to reframe and rethink about what the future might look like and how you've got to learn maybe different tools and different skills to, to actually be still relevant in this area. So that idea of being less reactive and being more predictive has been something we've talked about. And, you know, predictive analytics was in there for a long time. It was all around, we need lots of data. You know, one of the founding uh, pr uh, principles of building the Octane and um, platforms we're really about how do we get more data in there about the pipeline, be able to start predicting failure before it happens so we can catch this stuff earlier, but also understand how much extra work there is and whether or not you're using something like SonarCube to do that at the moment, or you're starting to build this kind of knowledge into the products. And I know there's a lot of re release automation tools that have started bringing in this kind of capability. But being able to understand and predict is incredibly important in the same way as not just failing, but failing forward is also important about how you can self-heal code, self-heal tests, self-heal platforms or infrastructure. These are all going to be new challenges as you, which you have to deal with. So I bring in the kind of the augmented intelligence because I don't think artificial intelligence is ready at this moment in time. So it still requires a human a human to be involved with this in the very similar ways that drones started off being piloted by people and eventually got the ability to be able to fly themselves, the same as autonomous cars, learn from how people the patterns people were doing with driving on roads, and then you now can go and buy a Tesla X, which will drive down a road. So part of it is we've got to train these systems, which means that we, we also have to teach them. And so looking at testing at every single stage, whether that be configuration as code, infrastructure as code, platform as code, it, whether that's looking at your YAML scripts and wrapping around tests within those scripts, you know, you have to think about the pipeline, what you're releasing down, but you also have to add value at each stage. So, you know, synthetic tests in an operations uh, operational sense is, you know, completely makes sense to make sure systems are working and, and reacting as they should be, all the way back to your comprehensive unit testing and code coverage techniques that people have been doing for decades. It's all important. And what I see a lot of is the disappearance of deployment teams and the DevOps infrastructure engineers coming in or your release train engineers not really be able to deal with the amount of pace and technology that's potentially coming down this pipe. So the idea of being able to deliver enterprise grade AI platforms into operations is incredibly hard. And when I sat down with the CEO the other day who's building an AI platform for, a, for an industry vertical, partly what they wanna be able to do is create value and the AI has to create value but it also has to be based on evidence so it has to be able to you know be able to do things like forensics to be able to understand why the decision was made in the same way that we would have to test these algorithms to make sure that the hypothesis is correct and that might be with different sample training sets data sets that might be with huge data or synthetically generated data which could in theory have things like cognitive bias so it may lean towards one particular type of usage pattern to another or a different type of gender or a different type of buying habit we've got to be able to synthetically generate 
realistic data that actually allows us to train incredibly powerful and complex algorithms. So suddenly this is incredibly hard. And what we've missed is what's already there in the real world. So the huge amount of untapped data from all the operational side of things around digital experiences, around handoffs between different transactions, whether that be M to M, so machine to machine, or it could be uh, one system talking to another system through a rest or whatever, or a bot to bot experience, whatever that might be, they're all transactions that you need to be able to realistically generate and test within your, your labs. So this is a really big challenge is how do we start moving into this as an experiment kind of area where you can trust the evidence that's coming out of the experience, the digital experience from operational sense, whether that be mobile, maybe it's Alexa using your virtual personal assistant, maybe it's your car, whatever it may be. How do you take that and model those interactions so you can visualize them and then predict what will actually happen? And this is a big challenge and data visualization and you know, being able to test in those environments is incredibly complex. And, you know, there is these tools that are already out there. So I'm not going, not trying to say throw everything away. I'm kind of just setting up the, 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 the understanding that you need to start playing across all of these different areas. You know, when I sat down with the CTO of, um, of Microfocus, you know, partly what they're trying to do and, and all the other large scale organizations are doing the exact same thing is they're trying to build that, uh, sharing of metadata across the layer so creating that do, that domain uh, or not domain specific language that understands the data between each one of these systems so that they can interact so yes it may still look like it's a sequential linear process but actually all of these tools whether they've been come through acquisition or they've been built by a team that use different technologies like octane for instance you know, they need to be able to take data, metadata from their quality center product, from their ALM enterprise products, and be able to share that data to provide insight, which means it also needs to be able to connect to storm and functional load and mobile center. You know, part of that is, you know, whether or not you're using Lean FT to actually generate storm render functional and it's running it in a Docker container in the, in the micro focus cloud, or you're running that local Docker in your, cube kind of setup or your local dev machine it needs to have data which it can use whether that's data that it's using for non-functional so it's trying to understand the performance from a user experience perspective or whether or not it's actually capturing any of the additional information that it needs uh, and metrics so that it can actually start building more realistic pictures around you know what what the actual experience you're delivering to your customer. So there's tools like ALM Prismira, which is building on top of Octane and the other stacks to start bringing in this machine learning. So, you know, this stuff will start stepping forwards in the same way that before ALI, which was the application lifecycle intelligence, used to connect these products and sync them together like Agile Manager and QC so that you could start getting and creating more uh, realistic information and, and insight to make better decisions about what you're trying to do. So I've been using for one of my customers at the moment, I've been using Lean FT, uh, which is incredibly powerful. You know, I've, there's some, some really good recommendations kind of came out of the first half of the, the presentation. You know, I definitely go and look at the Lean FT SDK. That's you can go and download that on GitHub at the moment. The, obviously, the link on here has got the Docker Hub. Uh, where you can pull down the Lean FT. There's one for Chrome, there's one for Firefox. You can just deploy that locally if you've got Docker for Windows or Docker Toolkit, or you're running uh, you know, any kind of Linux environment, you can quite easily deploy that. You can build your own and pull down the comp individual components. I've not tried it with .NET Core yet, but because it's got MS Build, you may see some of the functionality will run, especially under the end unit framework that you can create as one of the templates in Visual Studio for the C Sharp. You know, you can do uh, the end unit with Selenium uh, Lean FT template. You know, I've been using that today and it's incredibly uh, flexible. You can add in additional libraries to, to kind of create your kind of browser proxy. So you don't just have to run with the standard ones, you can run with your own. So if you're using Puppeteer or you've decided to move away from Phantom JS, you can do all that. And you can also run that quite nicely 
in in your you know your pipeline so you know a lot of what i do at the moment is everything has to be delivered as a docker container because that's how we release into aws and azure so this is kind of our definition of done is that the test whether that be functional or non-functional has to be delivered into a container and able to be able to release into the different environments and run whether it be running smoke tests regression tests whatever it is and then it needs to be able to wrap up that information whether it's test ng or some other kind of framework like quantum stuff you know and push that out into a format that actually links all the value together but you know one of the biggest problems with having headless tests is you can't see what's going on now don't get me wrong when i started doing automation in the 90s it was the most painful thing waiting for you know the screen to finish and now you don't get to see that yes you can pull screen set shots you can take screenshots on docker images and all the kind of normal stuff which you want to do you can do videos etc cetera, etc cetera. but actually it's quite hard to debug I'm in a similar kind of way to what we've been just talking about you know so I, you know, I'm using browser proxies at the moment uh, in, a, in a big way. So using something like Port uh, Swagger or some kind of man in the middle, uh, in this case, I'm using Kali, you know, and enables me to intercept the messages that have been sent from the, the uh, Lean FT. And then I can actually, you know, obviously I could manipulate them if I wanted to, but in actual fact, I can also understand the request and response pairs that are coming back i can see what information you know obviously i've got all those kind of xpaths and css because i'm getting all the you know the information but also i can use things like the spider to go on and actually map out the entire application so i can understand what you know which screens i've actually covered which ones i haven't you know what functionality that i've not potentially explored within the embed you know the, in the javascripts you know there's all sorts of other things that you can do so using these tools uh, not just for security but actually for uh, intelligent automation is incredibly powerful so you know i definitely recommend going out and, and exploring those side of things and then on the other side the operational side of things even if you're running uh, you know, in a just uh, a container management tool, you know, you can quite easily put on Prometheus or something like that and out, start out outputting what's actually happening as far as performance. I, I come back from the performance and engineering side of things. So being able to get those, those in, that information is really important because I want to see how those, those um, nodes are actually getting on. And I also kind of want to understand if there's any slowdown, you know, and of course the, the downside with all of this is, you know, you're losing the the the, the idea before of the, the rendering, which you would normally get using a heavier brow cross browser. So you still need to be able to create that, whether or not you're using Appium, whether or not you're using Storm Runner Functional, it doesn't matter, but you still need to be able to take that into account. But starting to put in transactions to start monitoring information around performance on individual, you know, browser complete, browser ready, rendered, you know, DOM rendered, you know, all that kind of stuff is incredibly important. So I've, I've kind of skipped through quite a lot of this at, at pace because I want to give, you know, as five minutes of clear uh, time to talk through some of the Q&A side of things. But also I wanted to just kind of add a few extra bits around you know, what I've kind of experienced as kind of the plus and minuses of, of the Lean FT platform. Um, you know, I've been there since the launch. I actually, I think my name's on the launch uh, announcement because uh, I was out there with the HPE guys in, in Vegas. Um, and, you know, part of it, I'd like I said, you know, part of the end delivery was really about it being able to go through this entire pipeline with, you know, into a container, which it's done very well, support more enterprise tools uh you know and platforms not just browsers you know it, which it's done really well you know i think you know the guys have got it nailed in that side of things you know the one of the big questions that i've always kind of said you know it's really important and you know firebug is is great at getting xpaths and there's other tools on the market that have great spy tools as well but actually having something that natively supports uh selenium and exploring selenium in a w3c way is 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 really a, a differentiator as far as i'm concerned because yes there's other tools but we know that unfortunately the original selenium builder the guy unfortunately didn't continue it they're they're rewriting it it doesn't have the same exporting functionality it's a lot more cut down doesn't support the latest version as well you know there's a lot of challenges around there so finding a tool a spy tool that can uh, can actually interrogate items is incredibly useful now it's got support to be able to su 
uh, to actually capture a number of different DOM items at the same time. You know, you can do the page model stuff that if you want to, if you want to implement that, you know, that that's great. I still a little bit concerned about how you, you they're not using a centralized uh, object repository store. So, you know, it does, it makes sense to have an object scanner, uh, which scans through, discovers what's the difference in change, and then deals with it in a centralized as code kind of uh, test automation as code perspective or test repository as, as code, because it needs to be able to understand based on the branching strategy, you know, a moment in time with the data and the builds and the components, what that DOM looks like compared to the previous version and should be able to switch back the DOM. Equally, when people are exploring it, they should also be able to understand if other people are adding items at the same time, how they can collaborate together because DevOps and methodologies like this are around collaboration. So, I, you know, I definitely want to see them be able to move towards more of a collaborative object repository store as checked in as code. And also the fact that it should be able to run natively in a browser, not as a standalone app. It is very slick, don't get me wrong, but it needs to get into, you know, that browser plugin kind of state to make it really lightweight, uh, which I know is really difficult. The code generation from it seems really powerful. You know, I, overall, I'm impressed. Of course, there's you need to be able to do more, re, um, you know, test type agnostic. So it doesn't just want to be able to do UI. You want to be able to also do, you know, performance and API and, you know, potentially start integrating with the, you know, the tools like the Shunner acquisitions, the service virtualization tools, you know, the lifecycle virtualization tools. You know, there's a lot more it needs to still do. It's still got to catch up on some of the object recognition stuff and the image recognition stuff uh, because, you know, there's a lot of open CV platforms now that are using computer vision, which you need to identify on metadata that isn't just in the DOM structure. So, you know, they've got a lot to, there's a lot of good things and I think there's a lot that they need to, to focus on. But, you know, that I just wanted to kind of throw that out and say, exciting times ahead. We've now got to prepare ourselves for the next generation of test it, continuous testing. So with that, I'm going to pass back to Chris and he's got a, a little bit more uh, housekeeping stuff to go and then we'll go into questions. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. And thank you, Daniel, for all your great information today. Uh, just to remind where I go through this last bit that um, we have uh, time to still get in some Q&A, so if you have questions, get them in the question pane uh, while we go through this. A reminder for the 2018 Cybersecurity Summit in Washington, D.C., uh, there's a register link found here and also on the Vivid website, where we'll have one of our board members, Chris Carpenter, and some of the Vivid staff, Terry, joining for some you know, booth time to chat with us, to learn more about Vivid. Um, please even consider stopping by and signing up to volunteer to be involved in SIG Talks as well. Um, I think that's the final slide. So let's get into some Q&A. Um, also forgot, sorry, uh, upcoming webinar this week on the 13th for steps to achieve data-driven culture with analytics in ALM using Total View. Uh, so please consider signing up for that uh, later this week. So one question that came in uh, regarding UFT and Selenium for Daniel or, or Jonathan in this case, and that is what advantage does UFT bring on top of Selenium for web tests? Um, yeah, okay. Um, let's say U UFT itself as a tool is completely different to LeanFT um, or not completely different. It's it's a, it's another tool, let's say it this way. Um, and why one should consider to use LeanFT is um, considering web tests, it's uh, LeanFT Lean itself brings out of the box some point that uh, Jonathan mentioned with, you can build an object repository, it's called application model, I think, in um, in LeanFT, where you can really structure your uh, application in a, in a different, in a, in an own class and then just reference to this class in, um, without using page object patterns and um, writing down your code itself. 
but you can just click at a new element and then you have this in your class as similar as in UFT with an um, repository object. Um, other point is that you can, it's not just web testing, it's more when, when you use uh, multi-application um, testing. So you, your entry point is a, is a web interface and then you want to uh, check this in your uh, uh, in your host backend or in your Java uh, in your Java application that is uh, uh, that the middle office is using, you you can create test cases that can do both in one script without switching uh, tools, without switching languages, and you can implement them seemingly straightforward. I think that the main purposes and or, or main advantages um, for using LeanFT it's that it's open for more than just web. Very cool, uh, very good point too. Um, in addition to the technology support, this question came in about, does LeanFT Spy support mobile applications, uh, specifically native mobile applications? Um, okay, I, I think I take this one again. So. I think for this Selenium for LeanFT, it, it does not, but the LeanFT basics by it takes um, mobile applications. It can integrate with mobile center and then when, when you have your mobile center um, window open, you can spy uh, applications on, on your mobile devices. Also um, native or IO or OS um, elements and, and so on. It's also capable of doing, I think, soft buttons and, and some of the hard buttons. So it's more or less the same functionality that UFT brings into mobile testing. I think DNFT has the same possibilities or the same points that they can do. Excellent. I think this next question yeah, could just, apply just to, to add to that, that one as well. Um, mobile Center is incredibly impressive with you can actually, again, have a container running locally and plug a USB into a device and and execute. So th there is some some really good work they're doing um, or to support mobile as well. And I think that's that's the important thing is it's not just it's not just web. It's not just browser based. It, you know, there's, it's an enterprise grade tool, not a kind of open source community tool. Yeah, I totally agree, Jonathan. I really appreciate that I can do full end-to-end -end tests where I might have some scenario that starts with a browser but then ends up with a desktop application, and I can carry that straight through with uh, one framework, one really one cohesive set of tests. Um, similarly, a question comes in about, can you use LeanFT with Cucumber uh, to create test sets? I think I know this, but I'd like to let you guys tackle that. Um, yes, so you can use LeanFT with most, when if not all of the uh, standards that are uh, on the market right now. So Cucumber, um, um, JBehave, I, I think there there is an integration. So you can use all your all your um, libraries that you have currently in place with LeanFT. Yeah, I think what's important out there is that it's at that point, I believe, and correct me, less about LeanFT and more about the unit testing framework that you're integrating with based on your language and um, IDE. So JUnit, NUnit, MS, something I can't think of. Um, you know, so availability there is key. Uh, another thing I'd like to throw out there is it's really nice to have the ability to expand your testing skill set without having to turn to a new vendor, without having to have 10 different tools to use to work with a variety of different technologies, but to be able to still have uh, an enterprise tool that we can use together, um, but really grow the skill sets out, getting past VBScript, going into a more um, standardized language like C Sharp or Java, and doing some really, really cool stuff. Um, yeah. I I'd definitely add to that as well in the sense of, you know, actually we're just one of the AI, the AI companies I'm working with at the moment, they do, one of the biggest challenges is end-to-end. -end. Um, and as you'd expect, you know, there's 
various different systems in the middle. Uh, of course, they still have a, a data visualization screen or a lab screen. So, you know, they've still had Selenium in there um, and they had a number of different frameworks that they work through and each one had different problems, whether or not it was the limitations around how it can interact with Excel um, or, you know, upload a file with, you know, an invalid file or whatever it may be. You know, it's good to be able to do end to end testing. You sometimes you have to chain a number of different tools together and suddenly it becomes, you know, you're at the mercy of open source. And, you know, you don't really have anywhere to to reach out to apart from the community and the communities are fantastic. It's just whether or not that's fast enough to get the response that you need to get on with what you need to achieve within, you know, a week. For sure. Um, a follow up question to Cucumber, and I think this will have to be our last question for the session is have either of you integrated a lean FT test with Cucumber in ALM and do you have any thoughts you can share about that? I can talk about spec map, which I've used um, for, but unfortunately it's within Visual Studio Team Services and TFS, but it's very similar. You can create your executable specifications uh, within whatever your application lifecycle management tool is. Um, and then you can just call the actual script execution. So, you know, that's, you know, the, the, the flexibility there is, again, it's a, it is a choice around your X unit framework that you decide to go with and whether or not that integrates with said tool, whether that be Jira Zephyr or ALM or another product, uh, but you can definitely do it. You can, all, you can definitely run stuff from ALM. Um, it doesn't matter what the language is. Um, and it's the same as what you used to be able to do with the UFT scripts. So you can definitely do that. Awesome, thank you for that. So that's the time we have for our webinar today. Uh, thank you both Jonathan and Daniel. It's been a really superb talks on focusing around Lean FT. Um, please uh, check the survey that's gonna come at the end. And uh, again, stay tuned for more SIG talks. And if anyone attending is interested in chatting or offering topic suggestions, please reach out to us. And uh, we'd like to know more. So thanks everyone, have a fantastic day.